Okay, thank you. So yeah, I thought well, I'd put a quick recap of the sort of things we talked about yesterday up front. Um, so if you recall, uh, the main thrust of yesterday's lecture was to uh, tell you that certain supersymmetric theories uh, can be reformulated in terms of a new set of variables, so-called twisted or topological field theory variables. Uh, and that reformulation of the continuum theory, which is fully equivalent to the original theory in flat space, is a nat natural starting off point for discretization. In the sense that it exposes one, or sometimes more, nilpotent supersymmetries. And it's those guys that we can translate to the lattice uh, without breaking them. Okay, and typically the actions for these theories is also has this sort of Q-exact sort of structure. Although we'll see today that's not always exactly a true statement and there are some caveats to the statement that, that, that act, the action is Q-exact. The, the sort of twisted, uh, the Fermi action reformulated in twisted variables uh, turns out to be something called the Kähler Dirac action, which is well known uh, in mathematical physics already. And what happens is that the fermions appear now as Grassmann valued uh, integer spin objects rather than spinners. Um, and when you put them on the lattice, they naturally live on links of the lattice rather than lattice sites. So it's rather a different kind of discretization than a conventional uh, approach to, say, lattice QCD. Um, at the end of last time, I pointed out that, in fact, there was no so-called fermion doubling in these theories, and I'll say a bit more about that today. Um, corresponding to the fact that the fermions are on links, also the bosons are on links, too. And typically, the bosons appear as complex fields or complex gauge fields, specifically. Uh, and that's natural because the supersymmetry has to take you between bosons and fermions. So if the fermions on links, the bosons are on links and, and vice versa. So what we saw last time was that the requirements of uh, Q symmetry, uh, gauge invariance, and this fact that we don't want to see any additional fermion doubling places severe constraints on the structure of the lattice theory. In fact, there's very little wiggle room in these constructions. Uh, once one, I told you last time how one formulated the uh, the analogs of derivatives in the theory, which were some sort of covariant difference operators, and the structure of those covariant difference, op covariant difference operators was very much determined by this requirement that the theory be uh, both Q-symmetric and gauge invariant. So we'll go on with that discussion today. So I'll pick up where we left off, uh, which was um, at the very end of last time I was discussing um, how it is these theories don't exhibit fermion doubling. Um, so I showed you a, a, a result for the fermion determinant, which could be sort of rewritten uh, as, a, in an, um, as a, a sort of an explicitly double-free scalar Laplacian. But there's another way to understand how this works um, uh, by mapping the lattice Kähler Dirac theory into a theory of so-called reduced staggered fermions. So that was a comment that came out in the discussion at the very end of last time. So the idea is the following. So we're in two dimensions still. So my lattice, if you recall, it's a square lattice with some sort of body diagonals, some diagonal links running this way. So I have one fermion, say psi 1 on this link, another fermion psi 2 living on that link here. There's a fermion eta located at the lattice site x, and then there's a field pi 1, 2, which is oppositely oriented running down towards x from x plus 1 plus 2. So that was, that's the structure of how we lay out the fermions in this model currently according to this Kähler Dirac prescription. But I can map this whole lattice theory, at least at zero coupling in the free theory, into a theory of staggered fermions. Um, so what I have to do is introduce a, essentially a lattice with half the lattice spacing. So this eta remains a site, uh, uh, this field eta lives at this site here, the Psi 2, you can imagine this, site, this link here corresponds to a site field on the fine lattice here. This link fermion here maps into a site variable on the fine lattice there. And the center of this link here gives you a site fermion on this fine lattice too. So I can map the original degrees of freedom, which were originally on links, into site fermions on this sort of lattice with half the lattice spacing. So if I do this carefully, and I won't do all the details here, you can sort of see how to map this theory into a theory of single component fermions living at lattice sites. And in fact, what you see is the forward difference operators that occurred in the original Kähler Dirac action now become symmetric difference operators on this lattice with, twice, with half the lattice spacing. And in fact, the famous um, 
staggered fermion phases that you, those of you who are lighter skates theorists know about, each of these sight fermions comes along in the kinetic operator with a certain phase, which depends on its position in the lattice. Those phases just arise from the fact you had these anti-symmetric derivatives in the Kano-Dirac action. So there's a one-to-one -one mapping at the level of the free theory between the theory I wrote down and this staggered fermion theory. Specifically, this, or this staggered fermion theory is a little unusual in the sense that there's only a single fermion at each site. So in ordinary staggered fermions, one has a sort of chi and a chi bar at each site. These are what are, are examples of what are called reduced staggered fermions, where one has only a single Grassmann at each site, corresponding in this case to say psi 2, psi 1, eta, or chi 1, 2. All right, so there's an example of reduced staggered fermions. So if you think about ordinary staggered fermions in two dimensions, they correspond to a situation with two Dirac fermions. Uh, when I go to reduce staggered fermions, I have a single Dirac fermion. Of course, that was the physical content of my starting point theory. I had two Majorana fermions or one Dirac fermion. So while there's no lattice artifact doubling in this prescription, it's certainly true that the theory doesn't describe a single fermion. All right? It describes, in this case, one Dirac fermion. But that's precisely the physical content of the theory. So there's no additional doubling associated with the lattice uh, discretization. Okay. And the same thing will be true, I mean, look at n equals four super young mills in four dimensions too. Okay. So let me just sort of summarize some of the things that, we, 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 that uh, we've discovered in constructing this lattice theory. So first of all, the fermions, of course, are in the adjoint representation of a UN gauge group, but they're now these anti-symmetric objects living on links. <laughs> The bosons are also links, complex link fields in general, valued in the algebra of GLNC. So they would ordinarily be in the group, of course. If I was doing lattice QCD, you're taught by Wilson to always put the gauge fields in the group. This is very different. Here you're forced by supersymmetry to put the bosons in the algebra because that's where the fermions live, and Q takes you from bosons to fermions. So they have to be represented equivalently in the lattice. So you should be a little nervous about putting the bosons in the algebra, but actually, it's okay. There's no problem from the point of view of the formal gauge transformation of the fields. The problem arises from the, Fermi, from, the, from the measure for integration. So in ordinary lattice QCD, one uses the Haar measure because the, 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 uh, the bosons are valued in the group. And that's the gauge invariant measure. In this case, I, because I'm in the algebra, the natural measure is a flat measure. And you might worry that the flat measure was not going to preserve gauge invariance because when a gauge transform, it tra the, the field U transforms differently at its endpoints. And so the Jacobian, when I do a gauge transformation, is not clearly unity. But remember here we have both an integration over U and U bar, and that saves you. Those two integration measures cancel against each other, and the final flat measure is actually gauge, inver gauge invariant. Okay. All right, so although we're using a flat measure and our fields are valued in the algebra, not the group, nevertheless, this lattice theory is still UN gauge invariant. Okay. Um, clearly, there's an S2 permutation symmetry in, in, as a sort of symmetry of the lattice action. And we also have some uh, center symmetries associated with uh, moving, uh, multiplying the elements of the boson matrices by centers of the uh, group, which are just U1 here in the different directions. So I can take U, Mu, and, and uh, basically multiply it by a phase. And that's a in clear invariance of the lattice action. But the derivatives that you need to arise to get the right naive continuum limit have to arise from expanding u as 1 plus a plus dot dot dot. So that arises naturally when I'm doing lattice QCD. If my variables are basically e to the a, then I get the 1 here for free in QCD. But here it's not guaranteed anymore, right? If I'm in the algebra, this 1 has to arise in some other, from some other mechanism, right? It's, um, and so what happens is you actually have to give a vev to the imaginary part of the, the trace mode of, U, of this variable u. That's going to break the center symmetry, and it picks a particular point on the moduli space to expand around. So the theory we've written down is very beautiful. It's gauge invariant, q, uh, q symmetric, has all these different symmetries. But if you don't this, you haven't got the right naive continuum limit. So you have to make sure that the theory is fluctuating around a particular point in the moduli space, which point? The point corresponding to the unit matrix in the expansion of u here. So to make that happen, you have to, you have to add some sort of soft Q-breaking term to the action, which enforces that constraint, the fact that I want to be able to expand around the unit matrix. And so we typically use something like this term here. It's just trace of U, U bar minus the unit matrix squared. 
So that breaks Q symmetry, but things are okay because you know there's an exact symmetry at mu equals zero. So it means that any Q breaking terms induced via quantum effects by adding this term to the action, of course, have to vanish, their couplings have to vanish uh, like some positive power of mu. In other words, it has to be multiplicative renormalization of those operators. All right. So you know exactly how to take the Q invariant limit. I just send, I compute at finite mu and then I send mu to zero. Right. And then uh, I extrapolate all my observables to that limit. So this is absolutely necessary. You can't leave this out, or else you don't even have the right continu naive continuum limit. Right? These, this unit matrix that arises here is necessary to convert some of those expressions to get, make them look like hopping terms or kinetic operators. If I don't have the one, I don't have kinetic terms in my action. So I'm doing some sort of funny matrix model, but it's nothing to do with uh, a continuum discrete field. Okay. Is that clear? All right. Um, I mentioned early on that, that, that this uh, twisting process is sort of intimately connected to uh, uh, construction of topological field theories. And I said at the time that we're not interested in the topological field theory aspects of this. We're using this as just a change of variables, and that's true. But of course, the theory nevertheless contains a sort of in interesting that is, um, a sector of the theory which can be computed essentially exactly, even on the lattice, in the semi-classical approximation. And, and here's the argument for that. So if I have some operator which is actually invariant under Q, so the subsector of observables which are actually invariant under the supersymmetry, if I look at the VEVs of those operators, I can imagine uh, computing the, uh, deri uh, the variation of those VEVs with respect to some parameter T, which is put in front of my action. So this is like the gauge coupling, if you want. So here's my... Here's my integration uh, that I need to do to compute the VEV. My action is Q on lambda, Q on some function. So I can take the d by dt of it, and it just brings down a factor of Q lambda. But if O is invariant, that just gives you this operator here, which is Q on O lambda. And so that's just zero by a water identity. So what you can see is that, in fact, this VEV, this, the, the dependence of this VEV on this parameter t is actually zero. There's no t dependence to this VEV at all. So I can compute this VEV in any limit of t I want. So specifically, I can take the limit t tends to infinity. That means I'm doing, a, in the context of a loop expansion, I can compute all these observables at one loop, and the result is exact. So this is a lattice theory where you can make some specific predictions in a, for a certain subsector of observables, sort of exactly by doing a sort of one loop calculation. And you know the final result is exact. That's very useful if, if for only practical reasons when you're debugging codes. There's some sector which is essentially, uh, you know, the exact answer. All right. There's what? So clearly one trivial class of these observables are just water entities. If I take Q on something, that's clearly invariant under Q, because Q squared is zero. And so, though, so the water entities are one example of uh, these sort of topological observables. Of course, they're trivial because they're already Q on something. So they wouldn't be interesting from a topological perspective, but they do correspond to something which you can uh, compute uh, at one loop. There's another very obvious and interesting observable that satisfies this property, the partition function. So if the observable is just one, that is, you're computing the partition function itself, uh, that'll, then you can use this analysis to see what happens, to, to compute the dependence of the partition function on where you are in the moduli space, where you're expanding around. Okay? So this is an argument that, that uh, Somatsura advanced a few years ago. Um, so, for example, I can imagine expanding U around some vacuum configuration. These vacuum configurations are just constant diagonal matrices. That's the moduli space of the theory. Those all have classical action zero. So I can expand around those with some fluctuations. If I take U to be this unit matrix I need for the derivatives, plus some general diagonal matrix, so it's any constant diagonal matrix I want, I can fix gauge in the usual way using a kind of Feynman gauge. That will introduce some fatty Apophov ghosts just associated with that. And then I can do the integrations at one loop. So I can expand around this, const this general uh, vacuum. What I'll find, of course, I have two complex bosons. So in the de denominator, I'll find basically the square of the determinant of the Laplacian, the lattice Laplacian. I showed you last time that the, the, the fermions give ri gives rise to a, um, another power of the deter uh, determinant of the Laplacian upstairs. And then these ghosts will also give their own determinant. And what you see is the determinants all cancel, which is what you expect in supersymmetry. So what you have is the usual cancellation of determinants at the one-loop level 
in this particular lattice theory. So the exact lattice supersymmetry has enforced the fact that z, which was a function of the background in general, is actually equal to 1. So it has no background dependence at one loop because of supersymmetry, because of the exact lattice supersymmetry in this case. Okay? So the effective potential v of b is independent of b at one loop. But by the argument I just gave you, that statement is true to all orders in perturbation theory. Right? The one loop result is exact. All right? So what we've proven very quickly here, and I haven't given all the details, but it's very easy to fill them in, is that in fact this effective potential is zero to all orders of perturbation theory. So the moduli space is not lifted in perturbation theory in these theories. Okay? So the flat directions survive quantum correction, if you want. In this particular theory, and it will actually be true for any theory with this sort of structure. All right. So that's kind of a ra rather strong and remarkable result. However, it makes you slightly worried about the stability of the thing from the point of view of doing numerical simulations. Because if my flat directions are preserved to all orders, um, uh, you might worry that the th the, and when I try to do simulations, I'll just walk down those flat directions off to infinity. All right. And so you can, you can test for that and argue for that uh, directly. So these flat directions correspond to points where the scalar fields commute. So I have constant, the gauge fields are zero, and the, the scalar fields are constant diagonal matrices. All right. So there's an infinite number of classical vacua. I've just shown you the potential doesn't depend on where you are in that moduli space when you're expanding. Um, and so you might worry that as I go, as I, to enforce, um, to enforce the, you want to expand around the unit matrix, so you apply this soft breaking term to the action, but you might worry that as mu squared equals zero, when I go back to this limit in which I did the previous calculation, those flat directions survive, and then you might worry that basically is the path of even well defined in the limit mu goes to zero. So I put this potential in to lift the directions, uh, the flat directions directly, but I've just argued to you that if I don't put that potential in, z is equal to one. So you might worry that as I take this extrapolated limit at mu squared going to zero, that there's a practical issue of the Monte Carlos just exploring the flat directions. And since I can take the size of b to infinity, then I can imagine that, that the scalars just run off towards infinity along these flat directions. So that doesn't happen. Okay, this numerical data sort of indicates this is a very old picture, but it's good enough. So this is some simulation of uh, the U2 theory on a six to the fourth lattice. The different colors correspond to different values of mu. This is the distribution of uh, eigenvalues of uh, u, u bar, so basically the scalar eigenvalues. Uh, so, of course, it's symmetric around the origin, but what you should notice is there's very little mu dependence in here. As I take mu down from 1 to 0.25, these curves are almost um, mu independent. So this limit mu tends to 0 seems very benign numerically when you actually do the simulations. And the reason is sort of straightforward to understand. It turns out that when you're precisely on a flat direction, this Fafian that arises from integrating the fermions is exactly zero. Right? So what happens is those configurations on the flat directions are actually suppressed uh, in the path integral. There's, they have weight zero strictly, all right? uh, because of the presence of these exact zero modes. All right? Now in the continuum, in an infinite volume, you would not be allowed to include those zero modes because they're non-normalizable modes. But when you're doing simulations on a torus, of course, it's natural to include all the fermion modes. And these zero modes have this nice effect that they actually render the limit mu squared equals zero well-defined. So if you get close to a flat direction, the fermions push you back towards the origin because they don't want to be there because the fermions have an exact zero mode. So the system is actually quite safe from the flat directions. Yeah. Periodic boundary conditions. So you have to worry what happens with thermal. And indeed, there are effects at strong coupling where this problem, the, the flat directions do come back to haunt you, but at least with periodic boundary conditions, it's completely benign because of, of this effect. So I'm a bit confused also. Do you claim even if you pick up flat direction in simulation, it just uh, somehow cancel, or you claim that the flat direction cannot be seen? I'm saying that the, the Fafian vanishes on the flat directions. You agree? Uh, I would not. Sure, sure. But you say, okay, with the periodic boundary condition, maybe. And then, first of all, then you, so, uh, runaway behavior at the flat direction is rather dynamically suppressed or kinematically suppressed. 
So it's a sort of dynamic suppression, if you want. Uh -huh. uh, so okay, so you don't really see uh, runaway behavior, first of so all. So if it gets close to a flat direction, it's highly suppressed by the fermion zero mode. Uh -huh. I know that uh, in, with periodic boundary condition simulation is more stable. Is right. it really is it take explanation of that fact? That's the that's the explanation. Okay. Right. right. So if I go to thermal boundary conditions, then of course I don't have the zero mode. And so the, the fermion suppression is much less, and that's why you can sometimes see that walking down the flat directions if you go to strong coupling with thermal boundary conditions, which we do do a lot of the time, so we have to be careful for that reason. But formally, at least, um, it's okay. Yeah. So you, U is a non-compact matrix, right? U? Yes, non-compact. Okay. So what sets the scale for the eigenvalues? Uh, the lattice volume. So if you look at the eigenvalues of the fermion operator, you will find they form a ring around the origin in the complex plane, and the width and the radius of that ring is roughly uh, 1 over L. That was the lattice size. That's empirical. So right. is it accidental that that's peaked at half, or is that just happens to be... Oh, I think that... I, I don't... Yeah, I, that's ex, as far as I know, that's... Into, I don't know. It's accidental, yeah. There's no significance to a half here. horizontal scale seriously. I don't think so. Okay. I, I, I've looked at this in more detail. I don't have pictures, but... Generally speaking, the eigenvalues cluster in the complex plane, but there's always a circular region around the origin where they're excluded, and the, the radius of that seems to go like 1 over L. So it shrinks towards the origin as you take L to infinity. Um, so the half, I think, is just accidental. I don't know. You, you don't have a theory for what value gets picked up? No, uh, not offhand. Maybe we could think about it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it depends on lambda and L. So there's some function of lambda over L. L setting the scale. You might also worry about whether this theory has a sign problem. Now, this particular theory in the continuum does not have a sign problem. The Fafian reduces to a determinant, and you can show that determinant because of charge conjugation symmetry has eigenvalues paired lambda, lambda star. So it certainly has no sign problem in the continuum limit. But because of lattice artifacts, it does in general have a small sign problem at uh, finite lattice spacing. So I can just measure the phase of the Fafian on small lattices and just see what it is. So this is just, a, again, a very old plot. Um, there's more, I think, that uh, various people will be showing in the uh, research talks later. But this is just an old plot from several years ago showing that in this particular theory, at lambda equals 1 and mu equals 0.1 here, so, but there's nothing very sensitive to those parameters, that this, there is a distribution of these phases alpha, but that, di that distribution becomes increasingly peaked as I just take the volume to infinity. So as I reduce the lattice spacing, it smooths smooth the, the phase of the Fafian, the fluctuations in it move towards zero, and the, there is no practical side problem to worry about here. They're just lattice artifacts which you have to extrapolate away at. And in fact, the typical phase fluctuations are small enough you don't even need to reweight if you're on any kind of sensible lattice bigger than 10 by 10, for example, at least at this lambda. The phase fluctuations increase with lambda, so you have to go to larger volumes as you increase lambda. But eventually, if you get to a big enough volume at any fixed lambda, the phase fluctuations are small, you're close to the continuum limit, and the Fafian is close to real positive definite. Okay, so there are no, at least in this theory, there are no barriers to doing Monte Carlo simulation associated with sign problems, which is nice. Okay, so let me summarize what we've said. So we learned how to discretize this topologically twisted version of Young-Mills. We're retaining, in this case, one exact supersymmetry. These are quite novel from the perspective of lattice gauge theories. The fermions on links. They appear as integer rather than spinner-valued uh, things. Um, the bosons are also on the links, of course, but they're complexified. Uh, they're also valued in the algebra. I argued, nevertheless, the measure is gauge invariant. All right. Uh, the number of exact supercharges, as I said last time, is related to the number of site fermions. In this case, just one, because it's just one eta. In certain cases, there can be more than one site fermion, and hence more than one um, uh, super, exact supersymmetry. You can compute certain objects exactly at one loop, and that's very useful from a practical perspective, and also tells you a lot about the structure of the theory in general. And there are no sign problems, in this particular case at least, and so you can use standard um, Monte Carlo techniques to try to evaluate observables in this theory, the sort of things that Masanori was talking about. Okay. So you can just take your standard algorithms from lattice QCD, rational hybrid Monte Carlo, and implement it for these theories, and, and that, that's something we've done. So let's move up in, uh, in dimension now. I've showed you this particular toy model, if you want, in two dimensions, uh, which has received a lot of attention over the years uh, because it does exhibit most of the features we're interested in. 
but let's think about what we can do in higher dimensions or with different theories. Um, it turns out that if you increase the number of supersymmetries in two dimensions, you can build families of different ladder theories with different numbers of superchargers, for example, eight. So I'm counting superchargers now as just real superchargers. So my n equals two theory um, had four Majoran of, uh, two Majorana fermions or four real degrees of freedom. And so that's why I'm going to count it as a, um, here as n equals four. There are theories with n equals eight and n equals 16 too that were constructed uh, by David and others, and in fact, uh, Paul and Matsurash classified many of these different theories uh, several years ago and showed the interrelationships between um, uh, different la uh, classes of orbital -orb theory. In three dimensions, there's a sort of unique eight supercharged theory you got, we'll, we'll look at actually in the next lecture. It turns out if it's a jumping off point for constructing uh, theories with uh, like super QCD in two dimensions. So I'll actually talk about this theory tomorrow briefly en route to constructing super QCD in 2D. There's also, there are also families of theories with 16 superchargers. Um, so I won't say anything more about these things at all. And we'll just jump right up to four dimensions where there's a unique theory you can basically discretize this way, which is this famous n equals four super young Mills theory, which has ex exactly 16 real uh, fermionic degrees of freedom. So that's the one we're going to, to, to work on today. And you'll see that, in fact, almost everything I said about the two-dimensional theory ports over immediately uh, to, the four, to this four-dimensional uh, n equals four theory. So n equals four is terribly interesting for lots and lots of reasons, which I don't need to go into, I'm sure, with this audience. So if we can do lattice simulations with n equals four, we might really be able to provide non-perturbed input to a lot of interesting questions in theoretical physics related to holography, uh, related to conformal uh, field theory, etc. So that's what we're going to focus on. Um, I'm going to take a slightly uh, unusual approach to get there. So if you know n equals 4 young bills, you know it's typically constructed by dimensional reduction from n equals 1 in 10 dimensions. Um, but I can actually not go directly to, n to 4 dimensions. I can imagine reducing the 10-dimensional the theory, first of all, to 5 dimensions. All right? And so there'll be an obvious reason for that, which we'll emerge in a second. But let me initially can try to construct this five-dimensional theory, and then, we'll, and then I can always do a dimensional arm reduction on that to get down to n equals four. But it turns out that the lattice theory we're interested in getting to is most naturally expressed in these sort of five-dimensional variables. And so it's natural to think, first of all, of the continuum five-dimensional theory, and then see what goes wrong when you try to discretize it in the way I've described. Something will go wrong, and you'll be forced into n equals four in four dimensions. All right, so, so the reason I say that is makes it, the connection to this two-dimensional toy model very, very clear. So, for example, if I start in 10 dimensions with my n equals 1 theory, and then I reduce to five dimensions, I immediately pick up five scalar fields, of course, because those are the five dimensions I reduced on. Um, the number of fermions is conserved. It was at 16 in 10 dimensions, so it's still 16. It's the same number of fermion degrees of freedom of n equals 4. But I'll also have five gauge fields still left in the game. Right? So there's naturally going to be an SO5 R symmetry in the theory corresponding to the fact I can rotate these five scalars into each other. So if I think about my twisted rotation group, which in two dimensions was the diagonal subgroup of SO2 Euclidean with SO2 R, I can do something similar now in five dimensions. I can take the SO5 Euclidean uh, Lorentz symmetry and take its, uh, the diagonal subgroup with the SO5 R symmetry. So that's very natural. And immediately you, what you expect is, since the, the structure is almost the same of two dimensions, is that the bosonic degrees of freedom will end up being packaged into a five complex fields A, just like there were two complex fields A in two dimensions. And then naturally I'll have my 16 fermions will break out as a, scale, as a, as a, a scalar, a vector, an anti-symmetric tensor in, two, in five dimensions. All right? So the continuum theory can be written as you might expect in terms of this, comp this calligraphic A, where, A runs with, where the index runs from 1 to 5, and then these 10 fermions packaged in this particular way. And if I want, I can always get down to n equals 4 by dimensional reduction of that theory later on. So let's just focus on this five-dimensional theory to start with. So the supersymmetry, the action of Q in this five-dimensional continuum theory is precisely the same as the one we had in two dimensions. So in other words, Q will act on A and take you into a psi. Q on chi will give you a, basically F bar. Eta will go into an auxiliary field D, 
Psi itself is a singlet, A bar is a singlet, and D is a singlet on the Q. This is precisely the same structure we had in two dimensions. So we can just use that straight away. Um, again, the scalars have been sort of re-emerged as vectors under the twisted group. That was an argument we made last time around, and it's just the same here. So they combine with the gauge fields into this complex sort of calligraphic or curly A. There are two complex derivatives that emerge naturally and a complex field strength, which is the commutator of the two. So this is all precisely the same as two dimensions. And you can see that Q squared is zero is just manifest here, just as it was in 2D. So I can import everything we talked about in 2D straight into this five-dimensional theory. And the action is almost the same as the 2D theory. So write the same structure. I have a couple chi to F, eta to D bar D commutator, and then eta to D over here, the auxiliary field. Take the trace, integrate now over five dimensions. I'll imagine the five dimensions is some four-dimensional manifold cross S1, because I'm going to reduce on an S1 in the end to get to n equals four. So that's the same action we had in, two, in the two-dimensional toy model. But notice I have one new freedom here. There's a new topological term I can write down, which is not Q exact, where I just couple the two chi's through a D bar using the invariant epsilon symbol. So that's a new operator that I, could have, that I couldn't write down in two dimensions, and I can write down now. And a similar, by the way, a similar term occurs in the eight supercharged theory in three dimensions. So in certain particular theories, in certain numbers of dimensions, there are additional Q-closed terms you can write down, which you need, in fact, to maintain, to make the connection back to the super Young Mills theory. Right? So in fact, we do need this thing with a particular coefficient in front to get back to the theory we're interested in. Right, so Q squared is zero, guarantees this is already invariant under Q. And you see the, the structure of the theory is also interesting. When I operate with Q on this term, Q on chi gives me an F bar, and so I have epsilon D bar F bar, and so it vanishes by the Bianchi identity. So this theory doesn't depend on the metric, so it's topological, like this term ultimately is topological, um, or it has a topological feature to it, but it's also invariant under supersymmetry for a non-trivial reason depending on the Bianchi identity. Right. So the same is true in the eight supercharged model in three dimensions we'll talk about tomorrow. Okay, so this is the continuum action that we're interested in. It has a Q exact term and then this um, sort of unique Q closed term that arises in this particular context. Right. So the question is, how do I construct a lattice theory from this? All right. I mean, you might think I should try to construct a five-dimensional lattice theory just along the lines we did yesterday. So let's try to do that and we'll see we're actually forced into the four-dimensional theory. Right. So, so let's proceed naively, proceeding naively, as per usual. So let's assume we have a five-dimensional hypercubic lattice. We're just trying to parallel what we did in two dimensions. So I'm going to assign the complex link bosons on the links, just as we did for n equals two in two dimensions. Notice the Q exact piece I wrote down can be latticized exactly the same way it was in two dimensions. So that Q exact term goes right over and it's gauge invariant and Q symmetric just in the way it was in two dimensions. So there's no problem for constructing the lattice theory from the Q exact term. The Q closed term is not invariant, gauge invariant anymore. So if I follow the rules for derivatives I talked about yesterday, I would replace that Q closed term by something involving this difference operator, D bar, acting on a chi at some lattice site. And you have to, this is actually, uh, this is the closest you can get to a gauge invariant term. But when you actually look at the gauge variation of this term, you'll find that in fact, gauge invariance requires that the sums of all these basis vectors I wrote down have to be zero. So this term is not gauge invariant. There's no way to write down a gauge invariant version of that Q closed term unless the basis vectors satisfy that constraint. That is, they're linearly dependent, and so they actually span a four-dimensional lattice, not a three-dimensional lattice. All right. So you can't, so you can't write down the five-dimensional theory on the lattice. It simply isn't gauge invariant. But what you can do is restrict to this sort of uh, particular linearly dependent basis, which means that you're living basically in four dimensions now, and that theory is gauge invariant. So all the rules I gave you about uh, difference operators allow this theory to actually be gauge invariant. All right. So the lattice theory is truly gauge invariant and supersymmetric if, it, it, if in fact it exists in four dimensions and not five. Right. So everything I, I wrote down for two dimensions ports over immediately. So I have five, gauge, five complex gauge fields as before. My 10 fermions are still packaged this particular way. Everything's assigned to links on the lattice. There's a single nilpotent supercharge. 
which takes you into Psi, etc. The action is this discrete version we talked about yesterday, and I wrote down the queue close term already. All right. Again, and this is perhaps the most remarkable feature about all of this construction, this queue close term is still supersymmetric even when I go to the lattice. And that depends on the fact that the lattice F, complex F, satisfies an exact Bianchi identity just like it does in the continuum. And that's perhaps the most non-trivial fact that, the, that emerges from this analysis, is that the, with the, dis, the, the prescription I gave you for F before, constructing F in terms of the U's actually satisfies an exact Bianchi identity. So I, because that's so important, I thought I'd just highlight that in a, a bit more detail. Um, I think I didn't say this carefully yesterday. So the F was just a D plus on U. Sorry, the plus is missing here. It's just a derivative on U. You notice this. So by my rules for discretization, it's just this object here. It's the difference of these particular link paths on the lattice. It's explicitly anti-symmetric automatically. Right? If you compute FF bar, the thing that appeared in the action, I told you yesterday it gave you the Wilson term. If you just plug this prescription in and compute FF dagger, you'll see that it contains this term, which is the Wilson plaquette operator plus some other terms, which if you were unitary would just give me a constant, one. So it would just be u, u dagger, u, u dagger on the single link. So this would just be trivially one in, in if I was doing QCD, if you were unitary, right? And here's the Wilson plaquette term that emerges. So those are already nice features. So this, this FF bar gives me basically Wilson operators. It's anti-symmetric automatically, but really what's most remarkable is that when I compute this object I need to show supersymmetry invariance, epsilon d bar f bar, on some lattice site, this boils down to a sum over link paths on the lattice involving three U bars, and because of the epsilon tensor, those come in pairs with equal and opposite signs. So the, all these link paths sum to zero. So there's an exact Bianchi identity for this, this, for this discretization prescription, which is not true for the typical F you'd use in lattice QCD. So it's a kind of a remarkable and independent of supersymmetry fact about this discretization procedure, this way of handling uh, the gauge fields. Uh, for, discretizing a gauge theory, is that the, the F you use satisfies Bianchi. So that guarantees the theory is still supersymmetric. But let's say a little bit more about this four-dimensional lattice. In principle, I just have to have the sum of the basis factors being zero. So there are many lattices available to me. But clearly, it makes a lot of sense to pick those basis factors in some symmetric way so the theory inherits sort of an S5 permutation symmetry automatically. All right. Um, and so, so that's what we're going to do. So the basis vectors that we end up using, you can think of them as corresponding to, say, taking a hypertetrahedron, an equilateral hypertetrahedron in, in 4D, sitting at the center of that tetrahedron and drawing vectors out to the five vertices. Those are symmetrically displaced, those back to the center, and those are ba the basis vectors that we're going to use for this particular lattice. This lattice is called the A4 star lattice. So. Um, there's another way to see what's going on here. I told you that you can get this theory by dimensional reduction from 5D. Now, the normal way you would do dimensional reduction is I'd start with a hypercubic lattice in, in momentum space, in 5D momentum space, and I'd set, one, I'd set K5 to 0, and that would correspond to dimensional reduction. But there's another choice you can make, all right, that projects you down four dimensions. You cannot, say, you cannot set K5 to 0. You can set the sum of the Ks to 0, right? So I can set this particular combination of derivatives to zero. That also projects you down to a four-dimensional momentum space, but it's now symmetric under exchange of the labels, so it's this S5 symmetric projection. All right. and, and what you get by definition, these are integers. On a, uh, if you go to a five-dimensional hypercubic lattice, this is a constraint on the discrete integers in the lattice momentum space. If you actually look up the definition of the A4 lattice, you'll find it's precisely the set of five numbers which sum to zero like this. So this, so the result in momentum space is the A4 lattice, and then the A4 star is just the dual of that to go back to direct space. So there's another way of seeing that it's this really A4 star lattice that plays the important role here. If you want a hand-waving understanding of what this really is, it's just the natural generalization of the triangular lattice from two dimensions up to four. So in two dimensions, if I took a triangle, an equilateral triangle, and I sit at the center of the triangle and draw ve vectors out to the vertices, I would generate a triangular lattice. And so this is sort of the natural analog in four dimensions of that triangular lattice. It's a very symmetric lattice. You know when you can constructing lattice theories, it's good to have as much symmetry at the scale of the cutoff as possible. So this is the most natural choice you would use. All right. 
So, the fourth dimensional equilateral tetrahedron. No, I mean I the the. I describe the, the hypertetrahedron as a way of constructing the lattice vectors. It's not built by gluing hypertetrahedra together okay. in any way. Yeah, because it can't do that, right? Yeah. No. Yeah. So it's just the lattice vectors. Yeah. I'm not very good at imagining what's going on in 4D, but I don't think that's the case. Well, there I mean, are many, many interesting lattices in 4D. Well, I mean, a four-dimensional tetrahedron has five corners, right? Right. So that, yeah. That's the five. Yeah. And then you use those vectors to generate this uh, yeah. F. Yeah, you take four of those five vectors and you translate them in all directions. That generates you a lattice. It's a well-defined prescription. I'll give you the basis vectors in a second. Yeah, right. So, yeah, Simon, uh, is there a similar construction for the 2D system that if you started in 3D, um, this, would you end up necessarily on a triangular lattice in, in 2D? You would, but you'd have to use more superchargers. So if I started in 3D with 16 supercharge, uh, with eight superchargers, and I did a similar construction, I think I would end up with the triangle lattice in 2D. Okay. But it would have twice as many supersymmetries as the model I talked about before. Okay. So there are ways to relate these things like that. But it would be a different supersymmetric theory. Right. 2D. Okay. Right. It's a different one. Okay, so there's the basis vectors. If you care about that, there's one specific basis. All right. So any the position, if I want to know where the position of a point is, it's just gotten by taking you know integer um, multiples of these basis vectors and summing over a four of them. So I just pick four of these e's, and then I just translate in all directions to get a lattice point. So when we actually store this the lattice in the computer, we don't store the, explicit, the E's explicitly. All we really need to do is store the N's. So I just store a cubic lattice with body, body and face diagonals. And from that, I can um, reconstruct the lattice as I need. So you don't have to hold this exotic lattice in memory as such. You can just basically hold a hypercubic lattice in memory with all the additional uh, face and diagonal lengths that you need to spam, to, um, to spam the A4 star lattice and then you can always reconstruct space-time positions using this sort of simple formula. So clearly the lattice theory now is, because I built it this way, has an S5 permutation symmetry, so that's the analog of rotational, uh, hypercubic rotational symmetry for this lattice. So it's higher than the typical hypercubic rotations. It's a bigger group, so that's good. What's actually kind of remarkable is that low-lying irreducible representations of this permutation group actually match one-to-one -one with the irreducible representations of the continuum SO4 group. So, for example, I have five of these U's lying around, um, but they naturally decompose under S5 into two irreducible representations, a 4 and a 1, right? And it turns out that's also true for the irreducible representations of SO4. So there's a natural way in which the irreps of these S5 flow into the ones you want in the continuum. All right, so all the fields in your theory naturally break up, so the 10 chi's break up into a 6 and a 4, for example. And those are precisely the dimensions of the irreducible representations of SO4 too. The continuum theory that you want to flow to, right? That's the continuum symmetry you want to inherit in it as you take the lattice spacing to zero. So that's very, very nice. And that's not true for the hypercubic group, actually. So in many respects, this, this theory is more beautiful than a typical quenched QCD hypercubic lattice theory. It has some very nice features to it. You can translate between these S5 indices, these, these Roman indices, and if you want the uh, SO4-like indices, the ones corresponding to the irreducible representations, using a sort of simple formula which just involves the, um, these position vectors E that I wrote down before. So this was written down in, in David and Mitat's original paper. Um, there's lots and lots of very useful stuff in that paper, which I didn't appreciate when I first read it, but I've used it a lot since. Okay, so it's very easy to go back and forth between the S5 indices and the SO4 indices, which is nice when you want to think about constructing continuum observables. Okay, so now we should see how these symmetries uh, affect the renormalization of the theory. So what do we have? We have gauge invariance, we have Q symmetry, we have this S5 point group symmetry, and then we also have a center symmetry. I can take the links in any one of these four different directions and uh, multiply them by a, um, a U1 phase. And also there's an exact fermionic symmetry. Associated with this fermion zero mode I talked about in two dimensions, you can shift the adas by a constant proportional to the unit matrix, and you show there's a symmetry of the Fermi action. 
Right? So you have these, all these symmetries constrain what can happen when under quantum corrections. What can the effective action of the, the lattice theory look like? And when you do a power counting analysis of the possible relevant operators that can appear, what you find basically is that the only operators which are relevant that can appear in the action under renormalization are precisely the ones you started with in the classical lattice action. So all that can happen is the coefficients to these operators, which are all marginal, can, get, can pick up renormalizations, but the structure of the lattice theory is already renormalizable. There's one caveat to that. There is an operator you could think of that's not in the classical action, which obeys all of these symmetries, which basically is an operator where you couple eta to uu bar, but it's not a derivative anymore, it's just uu bar. So, so this term is, obeys all of these symmetries up here and is not in the classical action. However, it turns out that this term, if its, initial, if its coefficient in the classical action is zero, it can't be induced through radiative corrections, at least in perturbation theory, because this term would lift the moduli space. And I can go through an argument similar to the one I did in two dimensions to show the moduli space is not lifted in perturbation theory. There's no effective potential. So this term cannot be induced, therefore, if it was not there in the, present, in the, start, in the starting action. So if you start off with no version of this, you can't induce this term. So it's quite interesting. You can use these symmetries together with the, the analog of that uh, computation of the moduli space to, to prohibit this term too. Okay. By the way, this S5 point group symmetry also guarantees that the twisted SO4 rotational symmetry is restored in the continuum limit, just like hypercubic symmetry guarantees SO4 symmetry in ordinary lattice QCD. So for certain, you get this back as you take A to zero, and the, the theory is actually renormalizable the level of the lattice action. So, um, what's the French time? Oh, geez. Okay, well, I'm going to skip this. This is just a, a reworked version of the moduli space computation I showed you for 2D, uh, reworked for 5D. So we did this a long time ago, and the only effort is reducing this Fafian to a determinant for the fermions for which we used some... Uh, just reduces to a fourth power of a, of a Laplacian, as you might expect. Okay, so summarizing, so it's th certainly renormalizable, no new terms allowed by power counting, no lifting of the flat directions, um, at least in perturbation theory, and, and in principle, four marginal couplings allowed, right? These alphas were all set to one in the initial class last lattice action, but they could, in principle, renormalize independently in the, uh, due to quantum corrections, all right? The way you take the continuum limit, we, you know, this is n equals four, so we hold g squared fixed and just send the box size to infinity, and possibly log tune these marginal operators to make it work. There's one other comment I would have to make, which is that since I have, I can always take three of these alphas and rescale the fermions to set them equal to one. At the level of the effective potential, I can actually only have one of these guys to tune, because I can use and rescalings to set three of them equal to one. So that's not good enough for everything, but it's good enough for things like thermodynamics. All right, um, everything I've said so far has kind of assumed that we can actually construct an effective action by blocking the theory out to the infrared, right? So implicitly in this analysis of counterterms, we've kind of assumed the existence of a normalization group that preserves Q and that takes you to long distances. So uh, a couple of years ago, Joel and I worked out a blocking scheme that at least realizes that in principle. It may not be an optimal blocking scheme, but it is one that preserves Q. And it's a very simple prescription. The blocked gauge fields, which live on the lattice with twice the lattice spacing, are just some scale factor times the product of the links. The fermions are related to, uh, again, the fermion on the fine lattice times a, a, a U on the fine lattice, sort of the symmetric combination. There's a, there's a prescription for the blocked chi, which also sums over paths from the blocked lattice site down to x. I won't get the specific form of f of p, it's not terribly interesting, but it's not very complicated either. So xi is a free parameter because the variables are unconstrained. So when I do a block scaling, I have to allow for a rescaling of the field, um, which is not something you do in QCD. So if I take the blocked field strength to just be the analog of the fine lattice field strength with the blocked fields, then you can actually show that Q on the block U gives me the block psi. Q on the block psi is, of course, zero. Q on the block chi, this is the hard one, actually gives me F bar, the blocked F bar. 
So I can come up with a scheme which pushes me out to a coarser and coarser lattices, preserving Q. And that's in principle what I need to make those previous arguments about the fact that Q is um, the, the associated with the, uh, enumerating the relevant operators under the uh, Q symmetry. All right. so, so that exists, and you can even test it a little bit. We did a little bit of that back in the... Um, then. And so, for example, you can determine xi, uh, this rescaling factor by just matching the 1 by 1 and 2 by 2 Wilson loops. And once you've done that matching, you've determined xi to all the couplings you're interested in. So here I'm scanning in the coupling along the bottom. And now I'm starting to look at other Wilson loops. This is the 2 by 2 guy. This is the 2 by 1 guy. The raw date, the, the initial bare loop is the black points. The red points are the initial measurement of the blocked loop. And then when I do the rescaling, the green is the rescaled things. And what you find is that all the small Wilson loops can all be rescaled to sit on top of each other with a single xi. So that tells us we're living close to a fixed point because I'm able to map all these different observables into each other with a single rescaling. So at least it, it's a sanity check. This procedure is not crazy, at least. All right. And this has not been checked at stronger coupling. And so this is a kind of an old calculation at this point. But anyway, the scheme itself seems to make some sense. If you want to go beyond symmetries and really figure out what the effective action looks like, you have to actually, um, you know, you have to get your hands dirty and do some perturbation theory at least. And so we, we did a calculation a few years ago where we looked at the one loop structure of the lattice theory by doing explicit lattice perturbation theory, having picked appropriate gauges. This is some of the ingredients you need to do that perturbation theory. It's very similar to what one would do in QCD. So there's some propagator for the A, A bar fields. There's some fermion propagator related to the um, inverse, the Kähler Dirac operator. Um, there are vertices associated with the couplings of psi, eta, psi, chi, and chi, chi. And there are basically, you can, you can figure out there are four one loop Feynman graphs that you need to determine, uh, the, to renormalize the three fermion propagators. And that yields three of those alphas I want to know about. So a single bosonic propagator gives you the final alpha. So there are four alphas to worry about. And this analysis, this, by doing four one-loop Feynman graphs for the fermions on one boson, you can find those four alphas. Um, so here's a you know, typical kind of uh, set of Feynman graphs contributing to the Kai-Kai propagator. So you do the calculation, and it, it takes a long time, unless you have a very good grad student, which I did, which saved me a lot of time in the end. Uh, and what you find is something remarkable, actually. It was remarkable at first, although we realized afterwards it was obvious. So what you find is that the self-energies vanish at p equals zero, that's what you expect, there are no mass terms, that's just supersymmetry. And the gradients of those deriv the, the derivative respect to p of those, sigma, of those uh, self energies give me log divergences plus finite pieces plus order a pieces. Right? And what you find is that these coefficients of these log divergences are universal. They're the same for all of the different self energies, which at first I thought was just, and the student came to me and told me that, I said, you must have made an error, there's something wrong there. Right? That of course it's correct, and the student was correct. Right? So these alphas are all the same at one loop. Right? So there is in fact no differential running of those couplings at one loop, which again is a remarkable fact. But in fact it was obvious on after many, many months that this had to be the case. And the, and, and the reason is the following. The Feynman diagrams you write down for the lattice theory map one-to-one -one with the Feynman diagrams you write down in the continuum. They're exactly the same Feynman diagrams. The vertices get shifted a little bit by phase factors. The propagators are lattice propagators, et cetera, et cetera. But the structure of the theory is almost the same as the continuum. And the divergences all come from regions close to the origin, PA equals zero. In that limit, you can always replace lattice propagators by continuum propagators, vertices by continuum vertices. And so, not surprisingly, since this is n equals four, all of these alphas have to come out to be the same because it, that's the consequence of n equals 4 supersymmetry. So it was correct. Um, uh, so the student did the calculation correctly, in fact, um, which I was impressed at because I'm sure I couldn't have done it correctly. Um, but it's even better than that because if you think about it, since all the log divergences are common to the continuum, you already know the answer in the continuum. The beta function of this theory in the continuum vanishes. So now you know the beta function of the lattice theory at one loop vanishes. At higher loops, this correspondence between the continuum and the lattice no longer holds. So at two loops, it is not true that you can replace all the propagators by continuum propagators, et cetera, et cetera. So it's only true at one loop. But nevertheless, it's kind of a remarkable result, a lattice theory where the beta function vanishes at one loop. Right. So this one Q symmetry, one out of 16, is buying us a lot. Right. 
15, okay, good. So um, I haven't said anything about these additional twisted supersymmetries. I mean, so we've talked only about Q, but of course there are 16 supercharges in the original theory. All the other guys are order A. So there's a, there's a, one to, there's a vector supercharge and an anti-symmetric tensor supercharge in this twisted language. These have to be restored, of course, in the continuum limit, or you're not doing any poor young mills. Um, it turns out the restoration of these other guys is intimately connected to the restoration of certain discrete R symmetries. So there are discrete symmetries that you can write down in the continuum theory, which takes, say, eta into a psi a uh, and chi into a combination of chi's. You can just do these transformations on the continuum twisted theory and show their exact symmetries. And it turns out that these discrete R symmetries, when combined with Q, generate these additional supersymmetries. So if I want to learn about the restoration of these supersymmetries, all I need to really know about is the restoration of these discrete R symmetries. So these don't hold at finite lattice spacing. They're, fu they're functions only of the continuum. But it's much easier to test restoration of discrete R symmetries than it's to test the supersymmetric word identities. So it's a practical issue. It's quite, it's quite uh, interesting. So there's some details here about how you would implement these R symmetries on the lattice. Um, and I'm not going to say very much more about it, uh, except that, uh, let's see, the way, again, you would take the continuum limit here is you G squared fix, sending L to infinity while tuning these alphas. And in addition, one thing to monitor then would be how, for example, N by M Wilson loops match to N by N Wilson loops when you act on it with the discrete R symmetry. So if this is true, then you have some good under, uh, uh, confidence that you're approaching the correct N equals 4 uh, at fixed point. So you would monitor these guys, expectation values of these Wilson loops would be one way to see whether you were getting restoration of R and hence restoration of these other Qs. All right, sign problem. So the story here is not as good as in two dimensions. All right, so we heard yesterday a lot about the sign problem. Um, in principle, one might hope to uh, do simulations in the, with this phase quenched Fafian by just reweighting techniques. So I can just take the, write the expectation value of the operator uh, in terms of uh, this modified observable where I put the phase in there. This alpha, again, is the phase of the Fafian. I simulate, of course, with just the absolute value of the Fafian. Um, and this whole process, of course, breaks down if this thing is fluctuating like crazy. Right. So as far as doing Monte Carlo simulation, you may, you may have to think very hard at this point if, this, if you really have a sign problem. Now, unlike the two-dimensional model I talked about, in, when I go to Euclidean space, even in the continuum, the Fafian is not guaranteed generically to be real positive definite. So in this case, it's not just a question of lattice artifacts. There could be real sign problems that persist even in the, into the continuum limit. And they may block the effective use of Monte Carlo simulation. So that's a, this is a, a kind of key issue you know, for, the, for the field. If you can't make this work, then you have to really think how to dissimulate the model. This, the formulation is interesting, but if you do strong coupling by some sort of numerical simulation, you have to get around this problem. So all we have ultimately in the end of the day to hang on to here is numerical results. So we, on small enough lattices, uh, we can actually compute the Fafian, the full Fafian directly, and extract the phase and see what's happening. So this is a, a picture from a few years ago now, 2014. So this is 1 minus the cosine of the Fafian phase as a function of the volume, the number of lattice points. For this particular theory at some values of the parameters, that's, it's not terribly sensitive to what you pick for lambda and things. For a couple, but three different colors, n equals two, three, and four. And so what do you see? Well, clearly at small volumes, the Fafian phase is very small. Here's 10 to the minus eight, so no big surprise. On smaller volumes, it's neg completely negligible. It rises as you increase the volume initially very steeply, as you'd expect for a pro system with a sign problem. But you notice that, at least at this value of lambda, it tails off and almost asymptotes as I increase the volume, as I go, uh, as I go up in volume. So we can't compute beyond uh, 4 cubed by 6, because this is, it turns out to be about the biggest volume. I mean, David Shake worked, worked very hard on a parallelized Fafian calculation to make this go at all. But even this calculation, I think, takes two or three days per configuration. Is that right, David? Eight days. OK, it's even worse. So this is really the limit. Remember, I have 16 fermions associated with every site, and we're in the adjoint representation for n equals 2, 3, and 4. So the number of degrees of freedom here is huge, actually, even though the spatial volume is not vast, or the space-time volume is not vast. Nevertheless, this is very, very, you notice even here, you're down at sort of the one, you know, below the 1% level. 
So in practice, you don't even need to reweight, even out here. Right? If you reweighted, the error would be smaller than the typical statistical error you're getting anyway. So this is an observation. Now, to make this go, I have to use anti-periodic boundary conditions. If I use periodic boundary conditions, there is certainly a phase assign problem. So almost all of our numerical work has been conducted with anti-periodic boundary conditions just for this reason, so that we can at least hold this slide up and say there's no sign problem, probably. Right? We can't, we're simulating bigger volumes than 4Q by 6. So I can't, uh, ultimately I don't know for certain that there's no sign problem on a 16 to the fourth box. But this plot is, uh, is our best evidence that it's not actually a major problem. And it's absolutely unknown why this behavior is true. You do if you get the very strong coupling. So that's the price you pay. At modest coupling, that's not a problem. You can use this mu squared parameter to control things. But it, it does come back to bite you as you get the strong coupling. And you see that particularly in these, some of these holographic simulations people are doing in lower dimensions with dimensional reductions of this. You get to very strong coupling or low temperatures. It's, it's precisely the liberation of the flat directions which stops you making contact with the leading supergravity result, I, I think. Um, Okay, so numerical results indicate where it's not too bad, but we don't know why. Can one do strong coupling expansions in this theory? Um, that's a good question. It's not so easy. Because there's only really a single coupling G squared in the theory, it's not so clear how to proceed to do strong coupling. I think Paul and Matsura, you, you guys looked at it, and you weren't sure how to proceed. So the answer is it hasn't been looked at very much at all. It is worth thinking about because if we do have real sign problems, the only way to proceed is some sort of other trick. Either you have tensor networks or you have strong coupling or something. Right? So I think it's very worth, worth looking at and it has not been addressed much at all, I think. Yeah. So why is it so mild? Um, well, there's no symmetry to pairing eigenvalues of the fermion operator. That's, that's very clear. That's true in the continuum too. So somehow the dynamics must be keeping the system in a region of the configuration space where the phase fluctuations are small. If I just pull the scalar fields or the, the configuration, if I pull the configuration at random, I will certainly have a big phase problem. But somehow when I run simulations with the phase quenched ensemble, I find I'm in a region apparently where the phase fluctuations are often relatively mild. Right? Notice that if I set at least one of the scalar fields to zero, I can prove it's positive definite. So it's associated with the scalar fields spreading away from the origin in field space. And at weak coupling, they're typically very close to the origin because you're in the superconformal phase or near it. And so this, this, this is sort of a dynamical reason for why things are not too bad. There's some very weird things going on. If you look at par oh, sorry. If you look at partial products of the eigenvalue, so I take eigenvalues of the Fermi operator on small lattices, and I just take products up to, say, the nth eigenvalue, and I look at the Monte Carlo ev evaluation of those partial products, they all have sign problems almost immediately, even at weak coupling, even with thermal boundary conditions, unless I take every single eigenvalue. So if I make n equal to the total number of degrees of freedom, suddenly the plot moves from 0 to 1, uh, the, which is the cosine of alpha. I mean, it's just remarkable. There's something very interesting going on there. Clearly, it's related to supersymmetry. But I don't have a good... It's been there for years. And the, if anyone has a good idea, it's a... It's an automatic PRL, as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> to fix this, to figure out what's going on here. All right. If I use periodic boundary conditions, I see a sign problem too, for certain. However, if I compute one of these semi-classical observables where I know the answer, and I just throw the phase away, I get the right answer. <laughs> so if I just ignore the phase for periodic boundary conditions, at least for topological observables, it doesn't seem to matter. Um, and if I use anti periodic boundary conditions, it's just very mild, I, at least at modest under. It clearly increases as I go to stronger coupling. So it may come back to bite us when we want to get to very strong coupling. So none of this is understood. I just, this is the best I can do. So it's a numerical observation that it seems to be actually better than you would have hoped for. Um, okay, I've got a few moments left. Let me say a bit more. So I haven't enumerated all the possible problems about. And, and involved with doing simulations of this n equals 4 theory. Um, we realized a few years ago that there are also problems associated with the uh, u1 flat directions. So this theory has to be formulated with a un gauge group because I need to get this unit matrix by veving scalars. Right? So I have no choice in this construction to do sun. I have to do un. 
And that U1 normally is irrelevant, right? In the continuum, it just decouples as a free field. On the lattice, it couples to the other modes and it plays an important role. Because what happens is, you know lattice U1 theory, compact U1, has a phase transition associated with lattice artifact monopoles. And you see exactly the same phase transition in this theory. So if I don't do anything about these, this U1 mode, and as I increase the coupling, I notice that the Polyakov lines drop towards zero, uh, the plaquette drops towards zero, and this density of monopole world lines increases up right here, around lambda of one. So it relatively weak beyond, rel as, as soon as I start getting strong at all in the coupling, the density of monopole world lines rises and all these other observables go crazy, uh, and we clearly are not doing the right thing. And in fact, in this phase here, it's even very hard to invert the Fermi operator. So I have very small eigenvalues associated with chiral symmetry breaking, associated with this compact U1 transition. So if you do nothing else, this U1 that direction kills you. Right. So you have to do something to control that. We tried a few different schemes, and in the end, this was the best. We, we came up with a scheme which conserves the Q supersymmetry. Uh, so this has worked with David Shake here. Um, so what we do is we modify that gauge fixing term, the thing that generated our action, by adding on a piece proportional to the determinant of the plaquette minus one. All right, so what, what happens is because you're in UN, I can couple the trace mode of eta to some other quantity, specifically in this case, the determinant of P minus one. When I integrate out the equations of motion, this generates a potential for the determinant of the plaquette, basically the determinant of plaquette minus one squared. So this pushes the theory towards SLNC from GLNC, right? The SLNC problem, of course, by definition, doesn't have a U1 at this point, so this avoids the U1 problem, right? Um, and this, because it's a Q exact term, doesn't break supersymmetry, right? So I can add this term to the action with some coupling G. I won't break supersymmetry, but I will generate a potential which, which suppresses the U1 modes. It essentially, at leading order, allows you to give a a uh, different coupling for the U1 mode from the SUN modes. It's like you have an, an extra Yang-Mills term with a new coupling for the U1 mode. At leading order, that's what this term does for you. Uh, and so this allows you to simulate that stronger coupling and avoid this monopole transition. At least, yeah, yeah, for a while at least. Okay, so this is just a plot showing, in fact, this action is much improved over one of our earlier actions in terms of, as I extrapolate L to infinity, this is a water entity it's going down to, it's just 10 to the minus 4. So I can satisfy the water that is very nicely in the large volume limit with this modified action. So this is a technical business, but it's important to do any simulations in this theory currently is to get rid of these monopoles. So all this code, by the way, is online. It's uh, in GitHub, so you can go get it and play with it if you want. Uh, it evolved from the milk code. So a lot of the basic communications involve milk communications. So it's built on top of that for those people who know about that. And I think it's written up in this... Uh, Again, this is a, a paper that David wrote with the details of this code. So anyone can go use it. It's based on the rational hybrid Monte Carlo algorithm. So we just replace the Fafian by this quarter power of determinant M dagger M. And we implement that through pseudo fermions and a rational approximation for the minus quarter power. So this boils down to a set of multi uh, 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 of linear solvers that are hooked together with these special coefficients alpha and beta determined by the Ramez algorithm. So this is just standard rational hybrid Monte Carlo. So, actually, I'm going to finish in a couple of minutes right on this summary, I think. All right, so, so let me say what I've said so far about n equals 4 Young Mills. So we have a lattice construction now, which is Q-symmetric, UN gauge invariant, possesses these additional S5 and U14 center symmetries in this fermionic shift symmetry. Those symmetry and power cognitive arguments reveal that the, uh, in principle, almost a single marginal operator may need tuning to achieve a continuum limit with full supersymmetry. We know how to monitor for that restoration of those additional supersymmetries by looking at these discrete R symmetries and how they act on Wilson loops in principle. Um, at one loop, there's no tuning necessary at all. There's just a line of fixed points, beta vanishes for arbitrary G squared at one loop. Right? And I just take the continuum limit by letting the box size go to infinity holding G fixed. Practical issues, we don't see a problem from the SUN flat directions, at least at modest coupling. The U1 modes you have to control with this Q invariant truncation to SLNC. And the Fafian phase is observed numerically to be small for lambdas of order one. Um, and so in principle, we are almost set up now to investigate issues of holography, connections to quantum gravity, things like S-duality. Can we see evidence for S-duality in our lattice simulations?
Uh, and properties away from the planar limit, where typically people can't do analytic calculations. So a lot is known about n equals 4 in the planar limit, the number of colors going to infinity. Much less is known, especially for non-BPS observables, away from the planar limit. And in principle, uh, that's something we would target with these sort of numerical simulations to make contact with that sort of stuff. I think this is probably... Okay. That's a good place to stop, I think. Some, some 20 seconds. Hello. Questions? <coughs> uh, so uh, I missed the detail when uh, you... Uh, uh, ah, sorry. <laughs> I was looking for who was talking. <laughs> I, I missed the detail when you were uh, the starting point for the n equals 4 theory, when you dimensionally reduced from 10 dimensions to 5. Uh-huh. Uh, so when you go from 10 to 4, you go from n equals 1 supersymmetry to n equals 4 supersymmetry. Right. When you go from 10 to 5, what uh -huh. was the amount of supersymmetry? Well, it's still 16, it's always 16 fermionic degrees of freedom. I think they would normally call it n equals 2 in 5 dimensions. Okay, so, so the, the twisting procedure was similar to in 2 dimensions, you started off? Yeah, it's more natural to, if you want to follow what we did in 2 dimensions, the simplest thing is to look at this, would be, well, to go to the, in the continuum is to go to 5 dimensions, because then the parallels are obvious. And actually, four dimensions is a bit more subtle, because when I do that initial, suppose I do a naive dimensional reduction of that theory, I'll end up with two additional scalar fields coming from that final reduction, a fine, a phi bar. And uh, the structure of the theory is more complicated and takes more terms to write it out. So this five-dimensional language is just a lot more compact. It's more naturally adapted to the lattice. Uh, and so that's, I wanted to motivate that discussion by going through the continuum five-dimensional theory, which is simple to understand from what we already said before. So it's not necessary, it's just a, it's, you know, it's not the way we described it originally, but I think it's a better way of talking about it, unless you go directly through the orbifold, where it also emerges naturally uh, in this sort of five-dimensional kind of language. Yeah. yeah. That was essentially my question, too. Okay. Yeah. This. Let's see. Um, something that uh, really struck me when we were working on this that I never resolved was that the <clears throat> the lattice basically depends where you are in moduli space. Mm -hmm. So if you change the position of the moduli space, you're changing the semantic action. And mm -hmm. if you were to simultaneously change the coupling and a theory that had running, then you'd think there would be some combined transformation that would just be equivalent to an RG transformation that would leave the theory invariant. Mm. Um, on the other hand, beta functions are associated with UV physics, yet the value of the moduli is being set in some sense by IR physics. Right. And so there's this strange connection between renormalization, beta flow, and the IR physics, which I don't think has been explored. I always felt like there was something deep there that I couldn't figure out. I agree with you. I, I, I worried about similar things. I mean, this, it's a very fascinating theory, and, and, and maybe the problems we're starting to have in, in getting to the continuum limit at strong coupling are sort of related to these issues. So we have to think more creatively about how the continuum limit has really arrived and how these different issues sort of intertwine with each other. So I, I agree, and I don't have anything uh, very helpful to say, I think. Yeah. This. What I've sketched as a continuum limit Way, a procedure where you just simply hold G squared fixed, L, send L to infinity and tune maybe these marginal operators may not be the best way of doing it or the best way of thinking about it anyway. I agree. This uh, amazing match between the representation of S5 and SO4, uh, which I didn't know actually, uh, you showed the lowest one. How if you go up in the uh, representation? It's not true all the way up, it's just yeah, the lower sure, 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 sure. elementary fields all live in the right yeah, representation. But the question is, is it a better approximation than the cubic group? Or even so that yeah, so I mean, you might think the higher you could deal with this. Yes, I think you could. I mean, you can use that technology and throw the supersymmetry away. You, you know, I, I've wondered about doing that for that reason. Just you know, other things to do. But. It'd be kind of cool to look at QCD on this lattice. Quench QCD, even, you know, just something simple. You, you have been keeping this Q square equals zero as exact. Mm -hmm. And you just mentioned about uh, other supercharge 15, how, how you can keep to recover 
the mm -hmm. symmetry. Mm -hmm. Now, I can guess that uh, depending on some physical quantity, you have to do uh, some sort of the fine tuning for, for, for right. keeping other supercharges. Right. Do you have any systematics for that? Well, so I would, uh, I think. Depending on the physical quantity, maybe you need to have several parameters, and the number of the parameters might be changed. Well, I mean, uh, my picture of how you would do that in principle, though it's still quite hard, is to look at these discrete R symmetries, so write down uh, differences between Wilson operators constructed on, in terms of the original variables and the R transform variables. Those are relatively easy to measure, right? Take those differences and try to keep those differences small on some subset of operators, so find two or three or four of those guys, hold them all small by, if necessary, adjusting the alphas as I take the box size bigger and bigger holding lambda fixed. That's my picture right now of how you would do it. But as David pointed out, it may be more, it may, it may be more subtle than that. I mean, that's sort of the naive way I'd imagine doing it. If you keep those discrete R symmetries, then you're guaranteed to have the additional supersymmetries. So it's much easier, I think, to talk in terms of those R symmetries than it is to write down the supersymmetric water entities and check those for consistency. Is that? No, I mean, in, in, there is a sort of the clear difference between two dimension and four dimension, right? Right. And two dimensional case, of course, uh, if you just fix the Q squared goes zero exact, then it helps a lot. Mm -hmm. But in four dimension, it's different. It still helps a lot. I mean, if I was to take Wilson fermions and try to do n equals four, a Joel Geek worked this out. There are about 10 relevant operators to tune to, to even hope of getting approaching n equals four. And some of those are things like mass terms. So they're not even, these are only log tunings, and there are at most four of them. So it, it, you've, you've, you've gotten a lot. It's probably too much to expect you don't have to do any tuning, right, in a four dimensional field theory like this. But you've certainly re made the problem manageable at minimum. We, by the way, we, so far we've yet to explore those tunings. We've not been at strong enough coupling where, we, where the one loop stuff is a problem, right? So we're, we've typically been simulating in the region where the one loop perturbation theory is actually quite good. And in that case, we don't even have to tune the alphas, just take bigger boxes. But at strong coupling, it's a different game. So with um, anti-periodic boundary conditions, mm -hmm. uh, if you are in a flat direction, it would draw you always outside, probably to infinity. Use thermal boundary conditions, then you definitely need an additional potential to constrain the uh, UU bar to be close to one. So you have this additional soft Q breaking term that helps you. But if you get a very strong coupling, even that, you have to drive that coupling so large that it starts to push you a long way from the supersymmetric limit. So yeah, because I mean, in theory, they would, would become attractive. So you would go to infinity with, with the scalar fields in that case. I mean, you can show, and in fact, next time around, I'll, I'll do that. You can show there's an intrinsic divergence in the thermal partition function. Yeah. So you can actually show that as I take the moduli further and further apart, the effective potential for those moduli at finite temperature goes to zero. So strictly speaking, if I meant to integrate over all the moduli, which I do in the partition function, there's a strict thermal divergence, z equals infinity, from the associated with those flat directions. And that's straightforward to show. I'll do that next time. Because it's relevant to some of these holographic applications, in fact. Neither.